Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Reeser with the Valley Forge Park Alliance. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for the next installment of the Lunch and Learn series. Uh, first, a little Zoom housekeeping. I recommend you put your Zoom session in speaker view. There is an icon in the upper right portion of your Zoom screen that should allow you to toggle between speaker view and gallery view. Uh, speaker view is less distracting as it allows you to see only who is currently presenting. Feel free to use the Q&A chat feature anytime during the event, and uh, our speaker will answer your questions throughout the talk. So um, you can find the Q&A chat icon at the bottom portion of your Zoom window. So enter in those questions as you think about them. Uh, now I would like to introduce our speaker. Growing up in Levittown, Pennsylvania, Dave Lawrence first visited Valley Forge as a little boy during the 1976 bicentennial. He began working there as a tour bus driver while in college in the early 90s, working alongside his parents. After college, he became a social studies teacher. He joined the National Park Service in 2004 with stints at Richmond National Battlefield Park, Morristown National Historical Park, and the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island National Monument. In 2012, he found himself returning to Valley Forge and now serves as a park guide at the site he visited so long ago. Um, in addition to today's talk, Dave is giving another talk next week on July 8th called The Lives of Monuments, General von Streuben and LGBTQ plus history in monuments. I'll put the registration info in the chat box if you're interested in attending that one too. But first things first, you are here for Dave's Lunch and Learn talk, so let's get to it. Uh, Dave? Hi folks, how are you all doing? Um, thank you for having me here for this Lunch and Learn. Um, and yeah, it, it, some of you may have uh, been seeing some of my programs in the in the park. And one of my uh, one of my key themes I constantly bring up when I'm uh, to people who are visiting the park, especially those who are visiting for the park for the first time, is that during the Valley Forge encampment, this army was not hibernating. This was a very active encampment. I often uh, mention that there are two common misconceptions about Valley Forge. <clears throat> The first is we got tons of people coming out here uh, expecting to find a battlefield and sometimes surprised that they're actually visiting an encampment site rather than a battle. Uh, but another misconception, which is just as great or greater, is that uh, there was no battle fought here simply because it was the winter time, and that there, there's this idea that in the 18th century, wars were fought with more rules involved and that uh, the two armies would occasionally agree on a gentleman's make a gentleman's agreement to call off the war in bad weather uh, you especially hear about that with the british in philadelphia that basically during the valley forge encampment the americans are starving at valley forge and the british are partying in philadelphia and that is basically the narrative uh far from it the war never stopped. Uh, the work of the soldiers never stopped. Nobody ever declared a ceasefire. Although neither side was able to launch a major offensive against the one another, what they are involved in is a battle for resources. Uh, both armies desperately need supplies to keep their men functioning and their army functioning. And they're going to scour the entire tri-state area trying to get those supplies and also tried to keep those supplies from falling into the hands of the enemy. And it's inevitable with those sorts of activities going on that there are going to be clashes. The, the, the soldiers are going to run into one another and shoot at one another. Uh, and the, these combat operations, these kind of battles, little battles between the battles are the things that I wanna talk about. Um, and so what I'm doing, what I'm going to do today is just give you a basic sampling of some of the combat operations that are going on during the Valley Forge encampment in the Philadelphia area. Uh, I am not trying to cover them all. I am just using a sampling of them. And even then, this is going to be more of a breadth presentation than a depth presentation. I'm going to summarize each of these events to the best of my ability uh, to give you just an idea of the sort of activities that were going on. Uh, to do that, what I'm going to do is I have up on the screen, I'll put up on the screen right now, 
you should all be able to see a map of the Philadelphia area. Philadelphia is basically the square right in the center of this map. All of these different locations, I'm using modern place names uh, to describe places where combat or fighting of some form or another did occur during the Valley Forge encampment. Uh, what I would like any of you to do in the chat right now is to, if you have a particular interest in any one of these particular locations, if it's uh, someplace where you work, someplace where you live, someplace that you drive by on your way to work all the time, uh, and you want to know more about what happened at that location, uh, leave it in the chat, and then Sarah is going to be able to pass on to me, and uh, that'll, be the, that'll be the one I'll cover. So while I'm waiting for people, I'll go first. I'll do uh, Chair's prerogative. I would like to hear what happened at Radnor. I live just down the street from Radnor uh, in Devon. Um, so tell me a little bit about what happened there. Yeah, Rad Radnor is kind of an interesting case, especially because it was so, uh, it's so close to the Valley Forge encampment. And uh, it's you know, only a few miles south of where the uh, defensive lines were located. So... This engagement actually occurred, hold on one second, open this up. Sorry. This engagement actually occurred sometime in January, January 20th to be precise. Uh, at that time, the Radnor was being occupied by, uh, by Henry Lee and some of his dragoons. Uh, Henry Lee or Light Horse Harry Lee is uh, one of the more famous uh, officers in cavalry officers in the American army. And he was becoming very, uh, uh, very effective at harassing British forging and, and uh, uh, scouting operations in the area. But the British had been cued in onto where Henry Lee's base was okay. They ended up being in Radnor. Now there are differing sources on what precise building he was using. I hear a lot of places will actually describe it as uh, the, um, the old Spread Eagle Tavern. And that seems to be the one that's most commonly mentioned, but others say that he was actually working out of a private home. I'm not sure exactly which, but he was right in the general, that, the general area in Radnor. Um, the British send out a force of perhaps up to 200 cavalry and dragoons, mostly from uh, the 17th Dragoons under Major Crew, but there apparently were some others that, that joined in with them, to basically surround and ambush Henry Lee's outpost at Radnor. Uh, they did it at perhaps the worst possible time for Henry Lee because a lot of his men were out on patrol. He only had a handful of men left in the area when this attack occurred, and it was an early morning, just before dawn, you know, dim light, you know, nighttime attack. And uh, they, they start, an, start an attack. They actually are able to capture a handful of men outside of the house uh, who are able to give just enough warning so that the rest of uh, uh, Lee and his men, only about nine men or so, are able to retreat into the stone building. And then from there, they start doing a spirited defense. Now, he is heavily outnumbered. Only a handful of men facing, you know, a large number of dragoons. And so they're basically putting on a show of strength. Uh, they're literally running from window to window to fire out of it, to make it look like their numbers are larger than they actually are. Um, Lee also responds with trash talking and bravado to try to make it sound like you know, he's got a stronger force than he really has. Uh, there was one account from a British memoir that mentioned that Lee at one point saw uh, some of the dragoons, some of the British dragoons had broken away from the fight and were beginning to loot some of the surrounding buildings. And he actually, uh, Lee actually dropped shade to, to the British officers. And he said, comrades, shame on you that you don't have your men under better discipline. Come a little closer. We will soon manage it together. This is a lot of bravado, and, and it's basically a smokescreen because, again, he is heavily outnumbered. Uh, and he actually ends up breaking uh, the British attack 
using a trick that is so eye-rollingly cliche that if it was actually included in a movie or a reenactment, uh, people would would say that it, 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 it doesn't make sense or it's too corny to put into fiction. Uh, at one point, he actually shouted out uh, of one of the buildings, um, fire away, men. Here come our infantry. We will have them all. He was basically saying, look, here come our reinforcements. They're coming up the road. We're saved. There were no reinforcements. The, he's, he made it up. Nevertheless, the British on the other side, in the darkness, didn't know if he was bluffing. And so they used the better part of valor. They retreated and pulled back rather than be caught in an ambush of their own. Um, as a result of his coolness under fire, uh, Lee is actually going to be promoted to major as a result of this. And this, along with his other engagements in the Philadelphia area, is going to eventually lead to him getting his own independent legion, which becomes very active uh, later on in places like Paulus Fook and some of the southern campaigns. Um, both armies only lost a few men wounded, a few men killed, not a large number of casualties, but it was a very touch-and-go moment there. And uh, considering that Henry Lee was one of the really up-and-coming, talented young officers in this army, his loss would have been a major blow to the American cause. Interestingly enough, there are stories, and I haven't been able to nail this down with actual documentation, so take this with a grain of salt, that but nevertheless, I ha have had sources mention that among the British Dragoons was Bannister Tarleton, Bloody Ban. He wasn't a member of the 17th Dragoons, but in ambushes like this, you're often pulling people from various units and creating ad hoc forces. So it's entirely plausible that he could have been there. There are even stories that he almost was killed. Uh, he had accounts of his hat having been shot off, uh, off of his head while uh, from from uh, fire coming from uh, from the Americans in the building. So you have two very important and very famous, or in Tarleton's case, infamous officers who almost met their end in January of 1778, just a few miles away from where the American soldiers were digging their entrenchments. So any questions about anything I've covered? First of all, thank you for telling me about the Spread Eagle Tavern, because there is a shopping center very close to here that for a long time was called Spread Eagle Village, and I wondered about that. Um, so now I know. Um, all right, I have one comment. I believe that Charlton was major of brigade at this point. Thank you, Justin. Oh, yeah. um, hello to John and Berwin, my neighbor just down the street. Um, let's see. I do have a question here. Uh, it's not listed. This is from Bob. It's not listed on the map, but can you relate the Battle of White Marsh in December 1777 to the choice of Valley Forge and the ongoing logistical problems of food and supplies? That is a story in and of itself. What you're basically talking about is the road into Valley Forge and the whole White Marsh engagement uh, where the British kind of probed up into where today the Fort Washington would be. Um, and uh, uh, because they decided not to press their luck against the entrenched positions there, uh, they end up pulling back into Philadelphia. This was in the process of Washington trying to look for a location to set up a more permanent encampment. Uh, I will mention, though, that that's a little bit outside the scope of today's lecture, because I want to focus primarily on once the Americans are at Valley Forge. So basically from December 19th, 1777 to June 19th, 1778, I consider the Battle of White Marsh and that whole engagement to be really part of the Philadelphia campaign itself. It's one of the last major engagements uh, to end the campaign. Um, and is, to be honest, worthy of a lecture in and of itself. So, well, I've got uh, David uh, asked about Hatboro and Crooked Billet. Okay, uh, we'll we'll go to that one. Hold on one second. Let me. Yep. And somebody already knows the name of it, so I'm not gonna. Uh, it's not gonna be a spoiler for many. But yeah, Hatboro uh, and Crooked Billet was an interesting one. The. Um, uh, here we go. This. Is is actually, now we're getting into the spring. It's May 1st. And at that time, there was a small 
um, tavern in located near where modern day Hatboro is that was called the Crooked Billet. Uh, a billet is again similar to a barracks, very likely it got the name Crooked because it was in an L shape. Um, we're not, I, I'm people are still arguing over the nature of the name, but at that time. Uh, it was being used as the headquarters for the Pennsylvania militia. Now, during the Valley Forge encampment, a, basically a deal had been made regarding surrounding Philadelphia. Um, everything to the west of and south of the Schuylkill River in Pennsylvania was to be defended by the Continental Army. Everything on the east side of the Schuylkill River and basically north of Philadelphia was supposed to be protected by the Pennsylvania militia, basically all of Bucks County. Um, Pennsylvania's government actually promised close to 2,000 soldiers for that cause. And considering the vast expanse of area, you know, between the Schuylkill and the Delaware, uh, they would need that large a number of people. Uh, they never got that number. They, most of the time, they had less than 1,000. Uh, early on, they had less than 300, of which only a handful were actually fit for duty. Um, they also had recently lost uh, General Potter, one of their main, you know, one of their main officers, had to leave uh, to go home. He took a leave of absence to go home to care for uh, his sick wife. So the command of the Pennsylvania militia had been handed over to uh, Brigadier General John Lacey. And Lacey was a young, very inexperienced officer, and he was, ha and he was not getting the support that he needed. And this, in the entire Valley Forge encampment was a period, was kind of a low point for the operations of the Pennsylvania militia. Uh, over time, the British in Philadelphia begin to realize that north of the city is much less guarded than, say, west of the city. And they begin to push further and further up into Bucks County uh, and harass American foraging, American supply, you know, systems going through there. And Lacey has been trying to, you know, trying his best to, to maintain strength, but he has, hasn't been able to do it. Early May, he has a force of about 300 surrounding the Crooked Billet, and that's their main encampment. Um, the British, again, through spies and scouts, are at, find out word of where he's, where he's located, and they send out a force of around 850 men. To Lacey's 300. And these guys are all, the, the British forces, all veteran light infantry units, battle hardened forces. Uh, Abercrombie's light infantry from the 37th Regiment, uh, Simcoe's Rangers. You know, Simcoe recently came into command of the Loyalist Queen's Rangers and has been leading them very effectively in, in this area. Uh, you also have, again, Major Crew and his 17th Dragoons. They, uh, you know, the same guys who had tried to capture Lee are going to be part of this expedition as well. And they go up several circuitous routes and are able to surround um, Lacey and his force. They were basically caught by surprise. It ended up becoming a rout. They, uh, they had three columns. Two of those columns eventually were the ones who closed and they attacked. The other one got a little delayed, but it was still enough to create an effective ambush, which turned into a retreat, and the retreat basically turned into a rout. Um, the um, it, Simcoe uh, at one point actually, you know, fired a not, you know, fired, uh, ordered fire at non-existent uh, men just to get them to uh, re retreating men to stop and duck their heads, uh, thinking that there was a volley of fire about to come after them. He's just trying to do anything that he can to slow down the retreating forces and cut them down even further. Um, it's estimated that about a third to one half of Lacey's force after the battle is gone. Some of them killed, some of them wounded, many of them captured. A large number just run away to never be found again. And it basically destroyed um, 
uh, Lacey's ability to, and the militia, the Pennsylvania militia's ability to maintain control of Bucks County. Washington is going to be forced to bring Continental troops, spread his forces out and bring Continental troops over to that side of the Schuylkill River to try to protect that area better. Um, there was later on a lot of investigations. There were accounts of war crimes that were being committed by the British. You hear stories of uh, them burning down the crooked billet and actually tossing wounded soldiers uh, that, that were found in the fields into the flames. Um, so it, you hear that accounts of that a lot in, in guerrilla warfare like this, though, because these sorts of fights tend to be very up close, very chaotic. Um, it's very run and gun. You tend not to take a lot of prisoners this way. Uh, the one account that I heard that was a eyewitness account said that they came across a field with bodies of American soldiers that had been burned in like a wheat field and that the wheat field had caught fire. I am, from the way they're describing it though, it sounds like what had happened was the fire had come from the firing of the muskets and the wheat field itself had been caught up in the flames and that it actually engulfed the men after they had already fallen in the fighting. So it gets very confusing to try to figure out what everybody was doing during this time period. So, but nevertheless, it's one of the main big defeats of the American side during the Valley Forge encampment. It basically crushed any further attempts to try to maintain a strong defense north of the city. And it's going to force Washington to make a move to try to uh, reinforce that area, especially as spring is coming and it looks like the British are getting ready to evacuate Philadelphia. But that's a story for another location. Uh, any, any questions before I move on? None here. You want to pull that map up again so we yep. can uh, see your locations? All right. See our choices. Yep. It's like a choose your own adventure book. Pretty much. All right. Anybody out there in the audience have a location they would like to hear about? If not, I will pick again. All right. Uh, because I am curious about the Market Street Bridge. This one is one that you don't hear about very often. And uh, it's an interesting example of how sometimes the weather could actually sometimes serve to the benefit of the Americans, or at least they tried to take advantage of the weather. Uh, I'm going to pull up on, uh, and kind of on the background behind me. You guys are going to see a map here. This is actually a blow-up map uh, section of a map made by uh, British military engineers showing their encampments and their entrenchments around Philadelphia. This in particular is showing basically where the Market Street Bridge is today. Uh, back then, there was a Ford. And mind you, this was not yet Philadelphia. Philadelphia ended at 8th Street. Everything west of 8th Street was farmland leading over to the Schuylkill River. Now, at this Ford location, the British actually built, as it says on the map, a bridge of boats, uh, basically like a pontoon military bridge. And on the opposite bank of the Schuylkill, they built a series of entrenchments and defensive positions to defend that encampment. That is that entrenchment location is basically the closest location of the British to Valley Forge. Uh, it's usually the one that I met that I mentioned when I say that the you know the main you know the nearest British outpost was about 18 miles away. Obviously, they sent out patrols much further, but you know this this was their toehold on this side of the school on on the American side of the Schuylkill River. Uh, in February and around February 14th, there was. Uh, there had been some heavy snow and mixed precipitation, but there was a recent thaw. The ice was breaking along the Schuylkill, and floodwaters had started to push the ice down river. And it was actually threatening this pontoon bridge that the British had created. So they actually had to dismantle it temporarily to prevent it from being damaged from by the ice flows. That meant that all of a sudden, the men who are guarding the uh, entrenched positions are, uh, are separated from the rest of the army. The bridge that they're supposed to be defending is no longer there. There were some American troops in the area who found out about that, and they decided to try to take it, and they wanted to try to take advantage of it. 
And so they ended up launching uh, an attack against those out outposts. They had around 200 Continental soldiers led by Colonel Robert Ballard of the 1st Virginia, who were par forging operations over in Springfield Meeting House. They happened to be in this area. They saw this, this opportunity and they decided to take advantage of it. They ended up launching an attack. At the time, the, the only troops that were there were a small de a detachment of German troops, uh, Jaegers uh, from, from Ansbach uh, under von Erb and von, uh, von Boy. And um, they weren't enough men to even fill all the positions on the entrenchments. So when the Continentals attack them, they have to abandon the entrenchments. Now, they can't make their way across the river because the bridge is gone. So they end up going up to a local stone house and they barricade themselves in the house and they basically do what Henry Lee had done at Radnor. They start firing from, from the, the various locations. The, uh, the Virginia troops tried to storm on a couple occasions, tried to get close to the, the stone building, but they realized that the closer they were getting, the more likely they were going to suffer heavy casualties. And just like the British at Radnor, they used the better part of valor. After about a 30-minute firefight, they decided to call things off, and they pulled off a retreat. Again, minimal losses on both sides, but it's a perfect example of how, uh, you know, forces that were out in these areas were willing to take the initiative. If they saw an opportunity to attack the enemy, uh, they, would, they would do so. And uh, it's, it's an example of how any of the folks on either side who were in outposts like this had to be prepared to, uh, you know, for, you know, to at, at any time to to face an attack. Any questions before we go on? No questions here. Although, well, I guess I have one from Bob here, who's curious about uh, the Jenkintown area. Ah, okay. Uh, we can do that one next. As a matter of fact, uh, now I will point out, I sh Jenkintown is really has more of a. Uh, um, question mark next to it. I'm not exactly sure the exact location of where this occurred. And this is actually one of the last combat shooting operations before the British are evacuating Philadelphia. This is in June 8th, only about 11 days before the, the Americans are going to be leaving Valley Forge. Um, uh, uh, the British are stirring both sides are keeping an eye on one another. Washington is trying to get intelligence on what uh, you know what the British are up to. Are they loading their are they lo loading boats to leave by sea? Are they going over land? Uh, everybody has a pretty good idea that the British are preparing to march into New Jersey, uh, but that means that they're going to have to pull men off of their defensive positions. And Washington is looking for an opportunity to score an attack, so he sends. A very able spy and cavalry officer, uh, Captain Alan McLean from Delaware, uh, who actually becomes in incredibly famous and has kind of uh, develops almost like a Robin Hood mythology around uh, his performances here in the similar way that, you know, the Swamp Box, Francis Marion, is down in South Carolina. Alan McLean is for Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Uh, he seems to have been front and center or involved in some way or another with every major engagement and every major skirmish in this area. Um, but in any case, he was on a patrol with two other cavalry officers uh, down Old York Road, uh, heading towards the Jenkintown area, just north of the British lines. British lines would have been, you know, further south, uh, just above Callow Hill Street, basically where the Vine Street Expressway is. That was their entrenchment line, give or take. While he's out, he ends up getting ambushed by a British patrol. The two of the, the two patrols, this was not, I wouldn't even call this an ambush. I think it was more of an impromptu accidental meeting between the two of them. Uh, the British, you know, come across these, these Americans and they decide to give chase. Uh, the three dragoons are heavily outnumbered. They're not going to be able to stand and fight. So they just start a horse race and they split up. And it seems that like most of the dragoons, uh, most of the British dragoons end up following Alan McLean. And he starts leading them on a merry chase in the woods and fields up and around Old, Old York Road. Eventually, his horse is beginning to tire. There are two British dragoons that have broken away from the main pack who are just behind them, uh, but just behind him. And he's kind of realizing that he's not going to be able to outrun them. So 
he slows his horse down. He slumps over as if he's wounded, perhaps tired or exhausted. And he has a pistol that he keeps tucked in his coat. The British are looking to capture this officer. And so they ride up on either side of him. One uh, on one side ends up grabbing him on his right shoulder. And as the other one is pulling up on the other side. Um, and then Alan McLean springs. He grabs the one guy's sword that he had uh, had dangling from, from his strap. Uh, that he had, of the hand that he had put on, on the guy's shoulder, immobilizing his sword, pulls out his pistol, shoots the other guy. After shooting the other guy, he then turns around and pistol whips with two heavy strikes the dragoon on his right side. In the process, the dragoon is trying to wrest control of his sword away and severely cuts Alan McLean's hand. But he's able to stun, he ends up killing, possibly mortally wounding, or, or at least severely wounding the one officer, uh, knocking out and stunning the other. And that gives him the break that he needs to spur his horse again and make an escape. It's a small engagement. We're talking three people, basically, that are actively involved. But again, I think it's a perfect example of just the small, literally face-to-face -face moments that are going on at this uh, in, in, in these engagements. An another reason I like it is because there's a little bit of irony. I often argue that um, in these, uh, I often say that one of the reasons many people have never heard about these engagements is because they weren't big enough to make an oil painting out of. Well, this is the exception to the rule because this is the smallest engagement I'm gonna talk about today. And they made an oil painting out of it. James Peel uh, ended up recording for posterity, the event using descriptions that were made by, uh, by McLean in his unpublished memoirs and from accounts and comments made by McLean. Uh, and he actually made uh, two, possibly three different renditions of this engagement. And so, it is one of the few engagements here where there is some visual piece of artwork connected to it. Before I go, any, any questions? Well, that painting is super cool. I don't have any questions about this engagement, but I have a question from John. If you can follow through with Lafayette Hill next, he's always been interested in this engagement. Yeah, Lafayette's an interesting one. Uh, it's probably, out of all these events, it's the one that's probably gotten the most print over time. Um, I can bring up a map here that Lafayette is going to uh, recount. And, of course, today I'm using the modern place name Lafayette Hill, but what we're talking about is the Barren Hill Expedition. Uh, I'm, and it's interesting time because we're, we're going from one of the smallest engagements uh, to uh, in, in this list to one of the largest, not the largest, but one of the largest. Um, this is occurring in May 20th. And this is directly connected, by the way, to the uh, crooked billet ambush that I talked about earlier. When the Pennsylvania militia were no longer able to properly show strength in Bucks County, Washington needed to send Continental troops into Bucks County to patrol and gather intelligence in that area. And they, he decides to send out Major General Lafayette uh, in command of this force. It's a force of over 2,000 troops. So this is no small group. It's basically the number of men that the uh, Pennsylvania government had promised to send out this militia. They said they were going to have 2,000 men to cover this area. And they never could. Well, Lafayette ends up getting a force of 2,000. Now, among those 2,000 troops uh, are some Pennsylvania militia. General Lacey is uh, no longer in command. General P James Potter came back after his leave of absence, but he just recently came back. And he also has managed to swell his force to around 600. But there are 600 militia who are still very poorly armed, very poorly prepared. Nevertheless, Washington is also joined by uh, Brigadier General Poor's Brigade um, and some, uh, it, Alan McLean is again front and center in this. He and an independent company of about 50 mounted infantry uh, are going to be serving as scouts for him. And also Lafayette gets uh, some of the troops from the 10th Virginia Regiment, basically Morgan's famous riflemen. Uh, and lastly, this is going to be the engagement that incorporates the newly arrived uh, warriors from the Oneida Nation. 
uh, the Iroquois Confederacy had split apart as a part of this war. And around 47 to 50 Oneida warriors had traveled down from New York to join the American army down here. And they're going to join up with uh, McLean's company, Morgan's Riflemen, and the Pennsylvania militia in patrolling uh, for, and serving as scouts and light infantry for Lafayette's force. So Lafayette crosses the Schuylkill. And he basically makes it just to the other side to where Lafayette Hill, Hill is today, or Barron Hill, uh, just south of Matson's Ford, where he crossed. Um, it's about, he's setting up around the same time that in Philadelphia, there is a huge celebration, the famous Michianza, uh, where uh, General, uh, General Howe is being relieved of command and Sir Henry Clinton is taking over. And that might have been one of the reasons why the British decided to respond the way they did. Uh, when the British get word of this force, they attack. And by that, I mean almost the entire British army is engaged in an attempt to surround and attack this reconnaissance force under Lafayette. Um, they say, and we're talking probably around anywhere from 12 to 14, uh, around 12,000 troops of the British Army are going to leave. They're going to attack in three columns. Uh, the main uh, thrust of the, the columns are going to be uh, under Major General James Grant. He is supposed to do a sweeping nighttime march to come in and try and cut off Lafayette from the north and basically cage him in. Now, it's interesting, General Sir Henry Clinton is now in command of the army, but apparently Howe was front and center in all this. And I can't help but think that part of this was because if he could, th this would be a huge feather in his cap. He has been under a lot of political criticism back in England about his conduct during this war. And he's going to have to go back and defend the decisions that he made. Uh, it would certainly bolster his position is uh, if he was able to score a big victory right before he leaves. And also the French Alliance had just been uh, announced. And here's an opportunity to, to capture one of the most prominent and most famous names among the French officers in the American army. They could capture the boy, as the British called them, uh, called Lafayette. They could capture Lafayette and his force. It would help how not only, uh, it would help the British army tactically, but it would also help how politically. But it doesn't work. Um, the British sweeping maneuver takes a long time. It's a nighttime attack on narrow roads. The American outposts are able to give proper warning. Some people credit the Oneida. Some people credit McLean. Some people credit Morgan. Very likely it was a combination of all of those groups that saw these different columns approaching the American forces. And, there, and Lafayette is able to mobilize his group and retreat uh, down a narrow road up and, up and around to Matson's Ford. So by the time the British actually engulf and surround Barren Hill, they end up approaching on opposite sides of one another, and they end up encountering nothing but themselves. They're coming up one side of the hill, other columns are coming up the other side. Lafayette is nowhere to be seen. This engagement has brought up uh, a lot of repercussions for the people involved in it. Uh, historians love to throw blame for what could have been a near disaster. A lot of people blame Washington himself, saying that he sent an inexperienced young officer out on this engagement. He also sent, uh, he also sent a force that was maybe too large for its purpose. Uh, you know, they, they, they should have been small, uh, smaller groups and spread out and decentralized. A lot of people blame Lafayette. He had been located at uh, the Barron Hill position for roughly 48 hours, and he had been told to stay mobile and not commit to a particular location. Uh, and on the British side, a lot of shade is thrown at James Grant for failing to be able to launch his attack properly and, uh, and surround, uh, and, surround uh, and properly surround Lafayette's forces. Um, there was actually a, a British officer, let me see if I can get the name, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Downman from the British Artillery made a quote where he talked about Grant saying that he w wished he had been drowned uh, in Yankee cider for his incompetence during this engagement. Uh, 
General Simcoe or, or Major Simcoe, who was uh, and his Rangers were part of Grant's division, and he does mention in his memoirs how slow they were moving, but he doesn't put that that blame directly on Grant, but it could be alluded to. I think there's also a lot of armchair historian work going on here, though. Um, Washington is sending a, a large force, but it's a large force to cover a large area. They weren't going to be concentrated for long. They were intended to spread out into different outposts. Lafayette was immobile for, but only immobile for about 48 hours. He was sending out scouts to look for other locations and was very likely going to move to another location at that time. In the meantime, he had himself on high ground in a way that he could potentially defend the four that he would use as an escape route if, if an attack had occurred. And General Grant was moving a force of around 5,000 troops at night down narrow country roads. This wasn't a small light infantry maneuver. Uh, it's going to be slow. Things are going to run into problems. So I oftentimes think that, uh, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. We are able to put a lot of blame on these individuals when if you look at what they had to work with at the time and the information that they had, uh, they had rational reasons for each of the decisions that they made. Another person that comes up in this engagement a lot is Baron von Steuben, because a lot of people mention that Lafayette's expeditious retreat was due in part to the new training of von Steuben uh, and the fact that the men were that the army was able to effectively march in columns more faster and more effectively than they had in the past. Um, possibly. I'm not going to make a ruling one way or the other. I have heard uh, the historians argue the fact uh, it. Uh, training helps. I will just say that. Training always helps. Any questions before we continue? No questions. I think we'll need to pull up that map. Okay, sounds good. We got Lafayette Hill out of the way. Oh, yeah. Let's cross those off. We did Jenkintown, did we not? Yep, we did Jenkintown. Thank you. Short-term memory loss. I'm very good <laughs> at remembering things are 200 years old, but you know. Sorry, right. we got you. We got you. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Because I have one in mind. If I don't hear from anybody, which I'm not, um, tell me a little about a little bit about Philadelphia Harbor. Um, where in Philadelphia was the harbor? I guess I just never thought about this. And when I think about Philadelphia today, I'm sure the harbor is is long gone. I should basically say it's the piers right along the Delaware River, basically where, you know, uh, Delaware Avenue, Columbus Boulevard is. Today. Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, right around there, that, that was their major shipping ports. And that is where a bulk, bulk of the um, uh, bulk of uh, the British Navy was docked. And the British Navy were packed together. They were a formidable Navy, but packed together in, in the harbor and along the Delaware River there they could be a conceivable target as well. The problem was that the American Navy was just not big enough or strong enough to launch an attack against them. Even the, the uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania ships uh, that had been in Delaware Harbor had been run aground up near Bordentown and up near Trenton, uh, further up the Delaware River, to avoid capture by the British. So they decided to improvise, and they ended up uh, looking to a gentleman, uh, a guy who had already been known for being a, an innovator and inventor, a guy named David Bushnell, who is known for having created the turtle, which is the famous uh, submarine, a war submarine that was used in the Continental Army. Another device that he was creating was basically a floating mine. They called it a torpedo that were basically made out of large kegs filled with gunpowder with a uh, sparking fuse, uh, a sparking mechanism set up inside it that had a plunger sticking out of it. As these things would float down, uh, as these things would float in the river, if the plunger came into contact with a ship, the plunger would push into the barrel, setting off the, the, the sparking mechanism, and setting off, setting it off as a as a mine. Uh, it was a early example of trying to come up with a floating explosive mine. Uh, he had already tried it up in Connecticut. 
uh, off the coast of Connecticut. Uh, they had sent a number of these floating mines to try to take out the HMS Cerberus. The, the mines worked successfully, meaning they exploded. They, however, did not explode on the proper ship. As they were floating over to the Cerberus, another smaller civilian ship happened to just be floating by at the exact same time and intercepted one of those mines and got hit instead. So it actually ended up destroying a civilian vessel rather than their military target. This is going to be a theme. December 27th, a um, few days after Christmas, there are some young teenage boys hanging around along the, the banks of the Delaware in Philadelphia. And amongst the floating chunks of ice in the river, they happen to see a keg of something floating down along uh, in the river. They are probably thinking it's something that they could salvage and sell. They might be thinking that it's something alcoholic. But whatever the case, they take initiative, they grab a boat, and they row out to investigate and maybe salvage this piece of floating debris uh, that, they, that they find out there. In the process of trying to lash uh, onto this barrel that they found, it explodes, killing the, 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 the young, uh, the, the teenagers in the boat. Uh, I, numbers differ as it's two to four, four boys who were, who were trying to do this. Again, uh, military target is missed and again civilians are injured as a result but again it was a proof of concept now ice prevents them from launching any attacks for a period of time but by january 5th dozens of these barrels start floating down the delaware river to target the british in the harbor uh, and again the british ships are stacked up they're easy targets these uh, these barrels could very likely hit any of these major ships and cause serious damage except for one thing. During the winter, as the ice flows were getting more and more dangerous, the British had actually installed and, and planted uh, basically tree barriers, uh, basically huge log barriers into the rivers around where most of their boats were centered. And the mines, the, the, the mines that did go up, blow up often ended up running into those barriers and didn't hit any of the British ships. So in spite of all their plans and in spite of these issues, uh, and even those that do end up running into some of the British ships apparently don't explode. You can understand how this is a very nebulous and sketchy design. Like you have to have a plunger that is watertight enough to keep the powder dry, but also loose enough so that it hits with the proper force and sets off the initial charge. There's so many things that could go wrong there, especially with pre-industrial technology, that very likely a lot of the mines ended up becoming duds. Maybe they became waterlogged, or maybe the plunger didn't hit right, or maybe they hit the, 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 the ships at the wrong angle and with not enough force. But whatever the case is, it sets off a series of explosions and creates panic in Philadelphia, but it doesn't really cause any serious harm to the Navy. It does, however, create um uh, it, it is however recorded and immortalized in song uh francis hawkinson the guy who is famous for helping to design the america the uh, uh the the seal of the united states and the first design of the american flag actually ended up writing a poem called the battle of the kegs uh dedicated to this uh very loud very colorful very unusual event even if it didn't come up to anything and uh, that, that poem ended up being used as like a propaganda piece. He actually ends up making, uh, throw, throwing shade at the commander in chief of uh, the British at the time. Uh, as part of one of the, one of the lines in the, in the poem is, uh, Sir William, he snug as a flea, lay all this time a snoring, nor dreamed of harm as he lay warm in bed with Mrs. Loring. Um, How's uh, romantic engagements and entanglements both in Philadelphia and New York City had already become part of the rumor mill in the British Army. Apparently, it had spread to the United States Army as well, and Hopkinson was tossing a jab at the British commander-in-chief at the time. Any questions about anything?
Well, first of all, I'm so glad you you brought up that poem because I had actually brought it up on my phone because that poem is a delight. Ah. It, it's worth reading the whole thing. It's just, it, it's it, snarky and delightful. Yeah, and it's actually designed to be sung in the form of Yankee Doodle. It's set mm -hmm. to that rhythm. So yeah. if you if you kind of hum the main line of Yankee Doodle, that's how that that, that follows the rhythm of, of the poem. That's so, cool. Yeah. All right, I do have a request from David Fisher about Wilmington. Wilmington, Wilmington, Delaware, was uh, a main southern outpost of the American army. Soon after the Valley Forge and Cannon is established, um, close to 2,000 soldiers under General Smallwood, mostly Maryland troops, and the one regiment of famous Delaware uh, troops are actually sent down to Wilmington to uh, basically screen Philadelphia from the south. They are going to be joined by... Um, a naval officer, an American naval officer, who actually smuggled a series of small vessels down from the Bordentown and Trenton area, past the British down the Delaware, and set up base in Wilmington, Delaware. That gentleman's name was Captain John Barry. He was around 33 years old at the time. Most, some of you may know him as the father of the American Navy. Some of you may know him for this statue that you can see that's currently standing uh, you know, behind uh, Independence Hall. Most people know his name because they constantly curse it while they're stuck in traffic going over the bridge that is named in his honor. He would eventually become one of the first Commodores of the American Navy, and so the Commodore Barry Bridge is named in his honor. Uh, he was engaged, while, while this encampment is going on, he's basically engaged in raids against British shipping. Uh, they're, they're sending barges and large, you know, kind of ungainly vessels down the East Coast from, um, from Newport, Rhode Island, uh, New, New York City, and even some from Halifax, Nova, Nova Scotia, bringing supplies up to the British Army in Philadelphia. And he is trying to take advantage of that situation and attack these shipping uh, and attack the shipping. The one of his more fa more famous accounts actually was on March 18th. He had a really successful raid. He went out with uh, about a half dozen uh, small vessels, pinnaces, small gunboats, and so on, and uh, ended up attacking and capturing three different uh, British vessels. He first attacked two transports known as the Kitty and the Mermaid, and then a uh, small frigate that was being sent to try to uh, defend them was also captured and you know, surrounded by, by Barry's smaller groups and, he, and was captured. He's able to get both the mermaid, the kitty, uh, and let me see if I get, I'm trying to see if I have the name of the, the this, and I, I said frigate, I should bring it, let's bring it down a little bit. It was a schooner. Uh, the alert, um, he captures three ships in one really quick rapid engagement. Uh, he was hoping to be able to keep the alert, but by, by the time he's engaged in battle with the alert, the alert has come out and other British support vessels were beginning to, uh, to, to answer the call and, and try to come to his aid. He was still able to run the alert aground in Delaware, while the Kitty and the Mermaid were moved up the Christiana and unloaded in Wilmington. They end up getting... Um, all of the artillery that were on the different vessels, a lot, tons of entrenchment tools, which the American army desperately needed, engineering tools and stuff like that, all of which were things that the army was going to need, not only during the Valley Forge and Cannon, but eventually when they were going to be out on campaign as well. Um, and so it was a successful little attack. It's interesting when Barry wrote, to, wrote a letter to Washington, uh, and, and talking about the supplies that he got. Um, he also sent with the bearer of his message some uh, spoils of war, basically what I would call pirate booty. Uh, he said, uh, I have sent, he said to Washington, quote, uh, I have, uh, by the bearer of this letter, Mr. John Chilton, I have sent you a cheese together with a jar of pickled oysters, which crave your acceptance. I'm, I'm more familiar with fictional pirate loot 
So I don't necessarily consider a jar of pickled oysters to be like a, a major find. But then again, Barry is following the time-honored tradition of sucking up to the boss by giving them food. So it clearly worked. But it's just one example. I use this one event as a, a, an exceptionally uh, as an exceptional example of the sort of raids that were harassing British shipping during this time period. Uh, and again, so that, you know, these combat engagements weren't just happening on land. They were also happening at sea and they were things that were slowing down uh, the logistics of the British army who we often think were living large in Philadelphia. They were desperate for supplies and they were getting harassed on all sides uh, they could never just forage at will. They always had to go out in strong forces. All of their transports had to have numerous support vessels. And those are support vessels that were going to be needed later on down in the Caribbean and elsewhere when fighting spreads out in that direction. Any questions? I don't see any here. Um, so you could pull up that map again. And we have just a couple minutes left. Oh, I do so have one. one uh, let's okay. say one more then. Yeah, so I do have a message here from John Cook saying, often John Paul Jones is noted as the father of the American Navy. It's good that John Barry gets some notice as well. Um, there, uh, that, that is a, uh, a war between naval history snobs that I am not going to engage in. Uh, they both tend to have uh, claims to the title of father of the American Navy, uh, and, and both for good reason. Uh, that's a story for another day. There's actually a really good biography out there of John Barry. I think it's just called John Barry. It's released in the last, you know, five or ten years. Um, yeah. But it's it's really great if you want to read a little more about John Barry, yep. who's a fascinating guy. Yeah. Um, all right. So you know what, Dave? I think you get to pick our last our last location. What is your favorite one of these that we didn't get to talk about? Uh, all right. Um, you know what? I'm I'm going to stick with Darby. Uh, because not necessarily because it's my favorite engagement, but because I think it is vitally important it, in many ways, it's going to set the stage for what the Valley Forge encampment ended up becoming. Uh, so we're going all the way back to the very beginning of the Valley Forge encampment, uh, only a few days after the army arrived on December 19th, December 22nd, I mean, a few days away from Christmas, uh, Washington probably is still in his tent, isn't even in Isaac Potts' house as his headquarters yet. You know, it's only been a few days. When word comes of a massive foraging operation by the British down in the Derby area. Um, the, in the letters back then, they would often call it Derby, um, but it's still roughly, this, roughly the same area. And by a large foraging operation, I'm talking half the British army, basically around 8,000 soldiers are crossing over that little pont bridge of boats that we talked about earlier to engage in a foraging operation in the fields of, and farms of, uh, of Derby and Springfield and regions like that. Um, for Washington, this was seen as a golden opportunity. One of the reasons he chose Valley Forge as an encampment was so that if the British made a mistake or made or made themselves vulnerable, he was in a position to be able to launch an attack or an offensive against them. And this was basically what he had been looking for. He literally had the enemy in front of him cut in two, separated by a river that only had a small wooden bridge as a crossing. If he could mobilize the American army and, and launch an attack against those 8,000 British in, in Derby, he could surround and, and severely defeat a, a good chunk of the British army, possibly forcing them to abandon Philadelphia. So he starts sending out missives and letters to his various commanding officers uh, to mobilize the men, get the men ready, get their provisions set, um, have, you know, have the men properly armed, distribute ammunition, and get ready for a march. Then he starts getting all the letters back. All of his general officers are responding, we can't. They don't have enough men fit for duty. They don't have enough arms. They don't have enough clothing. They don't have enough provisions. The supply system is at such a breaking point that they can barely maintain camp 
let alone provision men properly for a multi-day campaign or, or a heavy battle in March. Um, so many men are unfit for duty. The army is basically immobile. This flips a switch because now Washington is no longer concerned about attacking the British. Now the concern is what if the British decide to push further north and attack him? So they quickly form an ad hoc group. They, they gather up about a thousand men fit for duty out of the entire army. Doesn't matter what unit they're from. They just form them together under different officers and they send them out along with Morgan's Light Infantry and along with the Pennsylvania militia who were still serving on this side at this early in the engagement. Um, and they basically put a screen around the British foraging and they start trading shots, basically putting on a show of force not really thinking that they can stop the British from foraging, but just to make keep the British honest and to make it look like if they try to go any further, they're going to encounter serious resistance. It was actually this engagement that led Washington to write a letter to Henry Lawrence, the president of Congress, the following day that has a famous line where he talks about uh, the Valley Forge encampment. I'm going, to, I'm going to finish with that quote. He said, I am now convinced beyond a doubt that unless some great and capital change suddenly takes place in that line, this, that in this army, the army must inevitably be reduced to one or the other of these three things, starve, dissolve, or disperse. He's realizing that this army has to focus inwards. The, the, his army is broken. He cannot, the, the British are now a secondary concern to righting the wrongs of the American logistics and all the other problems that are going to be plaguing the Valley Forge and Cameron for the entire encampment, but especially in the early months. And so out of all of these engagements, I think if this, if anyone kind of epitomizes um, the, the problems and the strategic and, and you know, logistical issues that the army is going to encounter, it was this event, this failure of the American army to be able to stop the British from foraging in this area that they had hoped to stop. And with that, we'll finish. Well said, Dave. Well said. Well, thank you so much for this uh, engaging and enlightening talk this afternoon. Um, you can find all the recording of this talk and of all of our Lunch and Learns on the Park Alliance website, so be sure to go check that out. Uh, next week's Lunch and Learn is called John Marshall, the Final Founder, um, and it'll be given by Robert Strauss, who is the author of a book by the same name, John Marshall, the Final Founders. So hopefully we'll see you there. Um, and lastly, thank you to all the members of the Valley Forge Park Alliance for your wonderful support of Valley Forge. You make our mission possible every day. Uh, I wish you all a good afternoon from Valley Forge, and we hope to see you next Tuesday afternoon for Lunch and Learn or next Wednesday evening for Dave's Talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.